Hi, this is my review of the Pathfinder campaign setting Distant Realms. This book contains six planar cities. This is a group of very unusual cities that are perfect for a planar adventures based campaign. That is, it's a great idea to use this book as a sort of companion for the Planar Adventures uh, Pathfinder book that I reviewed some time ago. I'm going to put a link in the description below. You could also use this book just using the Pathfinder system reference document. Remember that it's always available for free. I'm going to put a link to it in the description below of this video as well. Now let's talk about the quality of the PDF. The quality is great, top notch. Everything is well written and explained. The organization is great as well. I only found a couple of typos. You have awesome looking images and maps, the illustrations look so beautiful. However, at the edge of the pages, I still found that small horizontal line that I also saw in the Planar Adventures book. It's not that much of a big deal, but some could find it slightly annoying. And you have bookmarks, so it's going to be quite easy to navigate the entire PDF. Now let's talk about the content. Something that I found really handy in this book of Distant Realms is that you have two places that serve as a short reference that you could use in an emergency during an adventure. First, you have this small representative map or illustration of the different cities. You have a small paragraph of each city giving you a brief description. So this is going to be very handy if you see the player characters looking for information of a particular city you can look at these different paragraphs and you can and use them as reminders or sort of like refreshers so that you never forget what each city represents. The other thing that is also very handy and quite useful when running an adventure is uh, the first section of the book. It's just like an introduction or a summarized version of each of the cities without getting too much into details because for each city you get a lot of data concerning the appearance of the city, uh, population, qualities, type of government, the history, uh, relations, society, districts, uh, sites of interest. So it's very handy to have a summarized version of each city. If you are just looking for a short reference for each one during, for example, a series of encounters and you don't have the time for a more a detailed overview of each of these locations. Let's talk about the first city, Vazrakal. This is a city of anarchy. This is a roiling archipelago composed of hundreds of islands. They are cut up in some sort of unseen semi-stabilizing force. So these islands are floating above the cerulean void. And most of the citizens in Vazrakal, they go against the norm. They are sort of like rebels. You're going to find good demons and devils there, and also, for example, wicked angels. They are all sorts of planar beings that go against what is expected of them. So this is a city of true anarchy. The government is somewhat loose. You do have a ruler of the city, which is uh, the severed root, the first inhabitant of the city. And all of the citizens actually band together against any external threats. Although the city is quite welcoming, uh, to any who want to go against their established roles in life or in existence. If the city has some major enemy, it's basically anyone who wants to force other beings uh, to fit into a particular roles or duties or established uh, stereotypes or archetypes. One interesting thing about Basrakal is that every time someone dies, their life force actually add to the city creating perhaps new floating islands. And some of these places are quite weird. You could see like a body of water floating attached to Basrakal, of course, and that would be one location that you could visit. Many of these islands have localized gravity. That is, you get pulled to particular sections of Basrakal. Another interesting thing about Basrakal is that time flows differently outside of the city and inside of the city. That is, you could leave Vazrakal and come back to it after a few weeks. And inside Vazrakal, it's only as if only a few seconds or minutes have passed. And it could be the other way around. 
you could go outside of the city for just a couple of minutes and you come back and actually inside the city months or weeks have passed it's unpredictable now let me talk about some of the districts you have the center these islands make up one of the archipelago's few semi-official districts stacked buildings fill these central islands hosting Vazrakal's highest concentration of inhabitants you also have the flings which is the farthest of Vazrakal's islands that are scattered at the fringes of the settlement's outer borders. You also have the foundation. This island hangs at the core of Vazrakal's archipelago spiral. Islands adjacent to the foundation are considered part of the center, but the foundation harbors a peculiar planar resonance that seems to hold Vazrakal together. As I mentioned before, this is a place ruled by anarchy. There are only three rules that compose the tripartite oath. The first rule is uh, we are without gods, so divine spellcasting is not prohibited for anyone who approaches the archipelago, but demigods and gods could have some restrictions applied to them when it comes to granting spells or gifts to others. This is somewhat on the cautious side of things, that is, many deities want particular followers to follow certain rules or orders, and this would go against the anarchic atmosphere of Vazrakal. The other rule is my past is private. Everyone has a past uh, where there was conflict considering those uh, norms or rules that they escaped from in their native planes. So alignment, detection or any spell that reveals something about someone's past is prohibited in Vazrakal. The third rule is our sanctum is sacred. So despite the differences of the inhabitants of Vazrakal, there is a basic policy of non-aggression, courtesy and honesty. Mechanically speaking, you have a new archetype in Vazrakal and a couple of rogue and slayer talents. So the adaptive shifter archetype, which is obviously a shifter archetype, is rather than emulate other animals entirely, you try to learn to reshape your form on the fly in response to a range of stimuli, rarely taking on a new form for longer than necessary to overcome a challenge. So for example, you could activate Adaptive Claws that is somewhat loose in its name as an ability because it's basically dealing natural attacks that could be piercing, bludgeoning or slashing as needed. You also have a series of reactive forms. This is basically modifying or adapting your body to suit different needs. For example, you could have an adaptive defense when assuming this form, you choose one saving throw and you gain a competence bonus on that selected save equal to one of your attributes. Or you could take an aquatic form, so you could be better at swimming, a climbing form to be better at climbing. You could also take a giant form to so increase in size, like an enlarged person. You could also take a sky hunter form to move faster when flying. So you have many different forms like spiked form, sprinting form, pretty self-explanatory stretching form. You can also later on extend the duration of your shifts and in later levels you could gain unfettered wild shape. This is basically the ability to turn into other creatures. It works similarly to the druid's wild shape, except you do not gain the ability to turn into an elemental. When it comes to the new Rogue and Slayer talents, you have a line sneak attack. This is basically a sneak attack that lets you overcome damage reduction based on alignment, on a specific alignment, and an advanced form of this is Sever Alignment. This is making a sneak attack against an opponent, and if the opponent doesn't succeed at a fortitude save, he actually loses his entire damage reduction based on his alignment. At the same time, he also loses the ability to cast spells and use spell-like abilities with the alignment descriptors uh, for a number of rounds. Then we have this. This is a truly hellish place. Anything that you can think of concerning uh, high buildings made out of living flesh and you see corpses all around and fire and lava and smoke, this is the city of this. There are some things of value to obtain in this, there is trade, however sometimes the payment could be quite questionable, maybe souls or lives. And for the most part there is order within the city, even with all of those demons and hellish creatures and Erinés, 
uh, flying around order is kept by this pater and this pater with his wife Erekura they keep things running smoothly within the city so it's a place that you could go in to carry out some business or handle some important matters related to demons or devils but there is no guarantee that you will get out of the city alive or unharmed it is said that this city was gifted to this pater uh, as thanks for his services as general in different wars of hell and he has ruled with an iron fist by establishing a strict hierarchy however his queen Erekura seems almost benign in contrast although she is also quite manipulative that is she understands that there is a need for order but is also quite witty she sometimes goes against the plans of this pater himself so if the player characters are looking for an ally or a patron within this vile city she is the non-player character to go to if they can actually reach her some of the districts in this are the outlands which are grey hills of barren cracked earth that stretch away from this urban center in all directions you also have the ghetto of outcasts where the souls of the condescending and entitled are damned to wander this district building squalid tent shelters in the urban wastes you also have the iron heart this is the center of this this is the genesis and terminus of all of its paths and only greater devils or those with special allowances from this pater or his advisors may enter here you also have some sites of interest like the broken chains it's basically a mountain of chains pierced through with many towers you also have the fallen fastness which is a massive library and home to some of the most evil tomes in the multiverse as well as a record unique in all of hell another thing that is also quite interesting of this is that any map displaying or depicting the city of this changes with the city itself that is if some buildings are taken down or some new structures are raised up the map no matter where it is it will change some say that these maps are actually cursed and they actually affect those cities perhaps in the material plane where they are being read or used you have a new archetype in this city which is the Erecura Ranger so if you take this archetype you're basically a ranger who admires Erecura as a source of order within hell itself so you gain some special abilities based on this you are very good at diplomacy and bluff and being deceptive you get a fiendish animal companion and at the highest level you are very good at killing or capturing enemies that are moving through one of your favorite terrains and you also get a bonus when it comes to attack rolls against creatures that have successfully learned your alignment in the hellish courts of this you have new bardic masterpieces such as the symphony of the dark prince you can tart your vocal cords to produce an eerie melodious song about the wonders of this pater's court through this you can basically subject your target to a reverse gravity effect you also have night queen's fury you lay a curse on those who have wronged you this is a modified version of the bestow curse spell that affects those that have damaged you then we have heaven's shore this place is a great way for the celestial and divine forces to interact with planar travelers that are not normally admitted inside of heaven heaven's shore expresses divinity balance elegance perfection even in its layout and architecture for example if a street gets too crowded the roads actually become bigger broader so that people do not feel too cramped in they stop being so narrow and everybody gets more comfortable while walking the streets of heaven's shore and for example when you are moving from one building to another or from one place to another inside of heaven's shore the trip always feels just right you never take too long to get from one place to another and you, it's never too short it's just like a very pleasant journey in many ways heaven's shore feels like a piece of heaven so you would be thinking well everybody would probably like to move here right but it is governed by a council of lawful good archons that do not tolerate anything that deviates from the rules or norms of heaven's shore so you are somewhat at risk constantly 
of transgressing or breaking some sort of rule. But this doesn't mean that beings from other planes are not allowed in Heaven's Shore. In fact, that is the reason why Heaven's Shore exists, so that people can learn and obtain a divine knowledge and goods, so that trading and sharing of information can happen. So even those that oppose the alignment, the laws, the rules of Heaven's Shore can even be admitted inside of the city, usually with an escort of archons or angels. And all of this does not mean that conflicts do not happen in Heaven's Shore. It just means that you could have an army of angels, of Asata and archons uh, chasing you around for transgressing or committing some sort of crime. There could be conflicts between different visiting factions, but regardless, the divine objects and knowledge that you can obtain here in Heaven's Shore will surely make the journey worth it. Now, some of the districts are the governance, which is the central diamond of the city. It is dedicated entirely to the civil infrastructure of Heaven's Shore. You also have the shining markets. Merchants in Heaven's Shore have long known that the majority of visitors to the city are there for some form of trade. So here you can obtain armor, weapons, divine magic and the like. Now, when it comes to the sites of interest, you have the Academy of the Sixth Wing, which is a divine military academy. You also have the Fountain of Sea and Songs. This is located in the southern portion of Spire Court, and this spacious fountain serves as a shrine to the Imperial Lord Atonga and as one of the larger gathering centers for aquatic creatures residing in Heaven's Shore. You also have the Garden of Laughter. This is one of the public squares in Heaven's Shore and locals visit it for different plays, puppet shows, and comedic performances. Also, here in Heaven's Shore, there is a new archetype, and you can also learn new feats. You can be trained in all of this and more at the Academy of the Sixth Wing. So the archetype is the Sixth Wing Bulwark. This is a war priest archetype. This is for someone who follows a Ragathiel to lead in battle, to hold the line, and defend against any incursion of evil forces. This archetype specializes in using a shield, turning it into a sacred shield. This shield uh, grants different bonuses and benefits, it gives you damage resistance, it can also be used to protect allies, you can actually direct the shield as it sprouts burning wings and flies to protect the ally of your choice. You can also later on, in higher levels, teleport close to specific allies to protect them and even handle your sacred shield abilities as reflexive actions that is you won't have to spend an action activating this ability or that it becomes immediate when needed the fits that you can learn at the academy of the sixth wing are such as a coral support raising your voice together with your allies you will sound itself as a weapon this is a teamwork fit in which your chorus actually harms or damages an enemy by changing the type of damage that an ally's spell usually deals to perhaps sonic damage or acid or cold damage. You also have Heavenly Vein. Your weapons carry a trace of the divine when imbued with your vein ability. You also have a Join Wings. You have developed a deep rapport with your comrades that allows you to swiftly convey divine grace. So as you may have noticed, many of these feats Applied perfectly for a divine character such as the Paladin or the Sixth Wing Bulwark, usually focused on overcoming damage reduction, uh, dazzling your enemies, like the feat of Lantern Light, that your weapons become pure light, or the Lantern Style, which is a combat style, and a lot of them are teamwork feats. And then we have Shadow Absalom. It is located on the Shadow Plane, and it is somewhat of a dark counterpart uh, to the Absalom in the material plane. So Shadow Absalom actually came to be when a group of Aslanti that fled the cataclysm known as the Earthfall escaped into the Shadow Plane and founded this city on a mysterious site. There are still some mysteries about this original place where Shadow Absalom came to be and Shadow Absalom has a bit of a creepy or mysterious vibe to it. It's actually populated by intelligent undead, fetchlings. The city would be in complete darkness if it weren't for the glare. A great light at the center of it. The city is ruled by a very powerful and evil great worm umbral dragon by the name of Argrinixia. 
She actually killed the original council that ruled over the city and after arranging them in a macabre display, no one uh, questioned her authority. There are actually cults within Shadow Absalom that worship her. So she is a mysterious figure nonetheless. Sometimes she likes to display her power flying over the city, but other times she likes to rule unnoticed. And despite the dark inhabitants of the city and their even darker ruler, there are many visitors to Shadow Absalom, not only because of the goods that you can obtain here, and I will talk about a few interesting things that you can obtain in this city later on, but also because this city represents a gateway, a passageway directly into your original plane of existence if you ever feel yourself somewhat trapped within the Shadow Plane. The ruler of the city has somewhat of a stranglehold upon the portals that you can create, on the passageway between the Shadow Plane and other places, at least within the city, and only those with the Dragon's Blessing can operate and open portals within the city limits. Some of the districts in the city include the Dust Quay. This is adjacent to the Grey Dust Field Bay of Dusk. This district houses Shadow Absalom's considerable naval elements. So in this particular subsection you have dust instead of water. There are also the Hive Dunes. There is an intelligent race of insect-like folk known as the Desiriac. They live in harmony with the inhabitants of Shadow Absalom. They form a part of Shadow Absalom and they have a series of, or network of tunnels below the city. There is also the Outer Shadow. This is beyond the city walls and here various night hag soul merchants peddle their wares eagerly preying on desperate creatures and trading for the souls of the damned and destitute. Some sites of interest within the city include the Basilica of Apotheosis, which is a solemn black edifice lined with spiked crenellations and looming bell towers. Bell tracks, the outsiders commonly known as chitons, claim this foreboding structure as their domain. You also have the glare, the great source of light in the middle of the city. No one knows about its nature or origin, but this beacon of pure light shines out across the city, and it is blocked only by the buildings of Shadow Absalom and by the vaulting arches of the cathedral that contains this mysterious illumination. It's also notable that Shadow Absalom actually has good relations and trading with Absalom on the material plane. And some places of Absalom have darker counterparts in the Shadow Absalom. There are also some fits and materials that you can only find in this city. Most of them are related to the Light Weavers Guild within Shadow Absalom. So for example, you have the fit of controlled patterns. You can modify your pattern spells to reduce their chance of affecting certain targets. So this is quite useful if you are casting a spell with a particular area of effect that could include some allies or enemies and you can be selective about uh, which targets are going to be affected by your spells. You also have pattern message. You've become skilled at inserting secret messages into your pattern illusions. You also have shifting patterns. You can focus your concentration when maintaining pattern effects to slowly move them. And when it comes to spells, you have the inhibiting patterns. This is a spell in which you can create one or more uh, vibrant pillars of kaleidoscopic color that rise out from the ground and so creatures attempting to move through them they need to make a will save or they won't be able to pass through them or take further actions and they also become dazzled. You also have the scintillating wall. This is a creation of a vibrant wall of hypnotic light and color. So the wall does not impede movement or line of sight in any way. But creatures moving through it, they must be successful at their will save or they will become fascinated. Now when it comes to the materials, the shadow materials specifically, you have the as sight and the druhite. These materials can be used to improve or augment the effects of armor and weapon. They can be quite useful depending on the material. So for example, when it comes to Azite, it actually gives you a bonus on stealth checks and when you cast spells with the Darkness Descriptor, they actually last a bit longer. And when it comes to the Druhite, they make you harder to hit in areas of dim light. Even if they are using Dark Vision, your enemies will have a harder time trying to get to you. And you get a bonus attacking creatures that are trying to perceive you with Dark Vision. Next, we have Spire's Edge. This is the city of second chances. 
This, in most cases, is not so much a permanent residence, but rather a temporary stop, while purpose, faith, and objectives are renewed. There are beings here, known as the Asphodis. Now, the Asphodis are souls that lost their purpose, their faith. When they passed away, they were never pulled towards a plane or domain of a particular deity or power based on their own principles. Many of these souls are actually considered failed souls. So here, in Spire Sech, they have an opportunity to make things right. They try to engage in anything at which they felt like they failed in life. Maybe it's some sort of craft or science or anything that they engage some sort of activity or purpose. And they try to reclaim that uh, to become whole again. Spire's Edge in general looks quite gloomy. It has a somewhat Tim Burton-esque feel to it. However, because many souls go through this place trying to find their purpose or wither away into dust, many of the houses and residences are empty. So there are sections within the Spire Sedge that have that ghost town atmosphere to them. And it is because of this that if, for example, the player characters decide to visit this city, they will find lots of knowledge and products to be obtained. Lots of good trading opportunities because you have all of these people engaging in different activities trying to find their purpose. In fact, the overseer of this city, which is Salak, the minder of immortals, does everything possible so that these so-called failed souls can find their purpose once again and can move on to other planes or if it is in their fate or purpose, can reincarnate in the material plane perhaps. Spire's Edge is probably also a place that many adventurers will frequently visit if they are not careful in their adventures. If they are leading a highly dangerous existence, they will probably die and they will have to go to this place while they wait for their party members to revive them in some way. And this is actually to the benefit of the city because adventurers are usually quite driven by glory, by honor, by greed. They are driven by something. So uh, they could inspire the Asphodis in this place so that they can uh, feel that pull towards a particular goal or objective, a little bit more driven or empowered. Now, when it comes to conflicts within the city, there are some clashes between different types of gangs and syndicates and the city's psychopomp enforcers that try to keep order. Now, let's talk about some of the districts. You have the Bleak Borough. This is the ugly side of Spire's Edge. This is home to the bitter, the broken, that slowly try to find rehabilitation. You also have the outboroughs. These are less tightly packed than the city core. So they are a hive of tiny districts, all of their own, each with its own culture and purpose. You also have the Nines, which is a university district hosting the nine intrinsic schools of thought. So here they debate and do research and try to find the meaning of existence, morality, law. They have vast archives. However, this is not the only type of pursuit within the city. There are also workshops, uh, places focused more on more tangible crafts. So you can learn many things uh, here in Spire's Edge. And you also have the precipice, which is crowded between the tumulus and the edge of the spire itself. The precipice is the home of average urban residents, each removed from the educational goals of the intrinsic schools and instead focused on developing themselves in a way of skill or trade, as I mentioned before. One curious thing about this city is that it's kind of like sitting at the edge of land, almost like it's falling into a void, so it has somewhat of a vertiginous feel to it, like the city is constantly inclined somewhat. Some sites of interest include the Archive of Last Days because most Asphodis share a morbid obsession with the nature of their own deaths. So the time and place and those who were affected by it are detailed in the records here. You also have the Escapade. The souls temporarily visiting Spire's Edge are an incredible resource and an enormous liability. So the most prone to resurrection are great villains and heroes who may inspire the failed souls to move on. But in the meantime, you need a place where they can find 
shelter, a uh, place for gathering, obtaining information, interacting with others, and the escapade is a cosmic inn and tavern for that. You also have the Infinite Ex Carnarium. This is a massive curled asteroid lashed to the spire. The Ex Carnarium is shot through with tunnels and covered with several ominous curling towers. Countless band psychopumps dwell within the rock and the towers atop it, guarding the tempting target of Spire's Edge from those who want to carry out their predations on the souls of the city. Here in Spire's Edge you have a new trait. Maybe you want to create an Asphodi character. So you have the Asphodi trait, giving you a resistance against uh, different types of damage, such as cold, electricity, fire but you take a wisdom penalty because you are so unmotivated, you have a narrow and shallow experience or existence. You also have a couple of interesting archetypes. The first one is the Nemo Stealer. This is an alchemist archetype. So, a Nemo Stealer is, extracts memories, storing them as a thick vapor called Nemos. So you can create different effects with this Nemos substance and even return the memories as easily as giving someone a potion. And this is centered around the force of your personality. It is your charisma that determines many things instead of intelligence, which would normally be in the case of the alchemist. And you also have abilities or features such as the Rasu Gen. This is basically a mutagen that you can create and consume. And you become incredibly resilient, that is you get a bonus to saving throws, you get temporary hit points, but you cannot uh, perform or carry out complex skills or tasks. You also have the Anguish Bomb, and this is all about manipulating the memories, creating memories of pain and discomfort. It's inflicting psychic damage on your target. So it works similarly to normal bombs, but they inflict mental damage. And of course, those enemies that are not affected by mental attacks will also be immune to your bombs. So you better rely on the effects of your Rasugen to fight against them instead. You also have ways of brewing memories and even probing or going through the minds of your targets. You also have a list of discoveries such as Anguish Bomb, Dread Bomb, Grand Rasugen. And then we have the Quintessentialist. This is a spiritualist archetype. So this is basically splitting yourself into two. I think this is a very fun archetype. And one half of you, it's an exemplar. This is a way superior to you uh, shape or form. That is, this is your ideal self, better in almost any way. But you also have this other self that is like your weaker, more pathetic self. And so, as you would expect, the exemplar does everything better. But the weaker version of yourself starts to take damage as long as you remain split into two. So you better time your separation carefully, or you may end up killing yourself. Then we have Yulgamot. Yulgamot is quite different from the other cities. This is more like a planetoid that serves as a vehicle for many planar travelers. It's uh, moving through the astral plane and part of it uh, seems like a forest with lichens and purple trees and the other half is a desert. This is related to different changes that have occurred over this planetoid uh, mainly through the effects of the plane of fire, which charred half of this floating place. It is said that this place uh, served as the base for these strange methods of the Shulsagas, which are probably the most numerous inhabitants in Yulgamat. They basically use uh, the traditional magical flying discs as surfboards, more or less. So Yulgamat is used by many planar travelers, as a vehicle to move across the different places of the astral plane, like you would use a ship. Now, because of this, there aren't too many political struggles because many are just taking residence in Yogamat while they get from one place to another. But when some issue or dispute needs to be solved or treated, a temporary council of Shulsagas uh, come together and try to deal with the situation. And because this planetoid isn't exactly too big, places are either built up or built downwards. That is, you have some really tall buildings, but also many caverns and tunnels. And because there is low gravity in Jilgamoth and there is a prevalence of flight, many doors to these structures are actually hundreds of feet above the ground. The lower half of Jilgamoth is a desert you only have a point of reference, which is a small mountain by the name of Huskmut. And only the star dead 
are the ones who dare to settle at the bottom of this planetoid. This section is always facing towards the plane of fire. So as a point of reference, they consider this to be the down area of Yulgamot. There is an interesting contrast or discrepancy when it comes to the outlook of the Shul Sagas or the way that they look at the world. They are xenophobic for the most part, however they actually tolerate and accept many different travelers here in Yulgamot because they value any information or goods that they can bring to this drifting city. So it's mostly a matter of convenience. Some of the districts include High Cliff, which is a place with a few permanent buildings dedicated to scholarship and government when it is needed. You also have the Strangers Coast, which is the lowest plateau atop Yulgamot. It's also the most popular destination because it serves as a point of arrival for astral travelers while hosting attractions of its own. You also have the Guts, which is a series of tunnels connecting the four tiers of Yulgamot's top half and they lead into a series of subterranean caverns. Some sites of interest include Barber Stone Spa. Here, Yolgamot attract those hoping to rest and recuperate and wipe away untold aeons of stress with baths, massages and physical maintenance. You also have the House of Tomorrow. Yolgamot's origins are quite unclear and it is considered an offense to point out that the Elohim created Yolgamot or that they even had the Shulsagas as servants at one point. So in the House of Tomorrow, the Shulsagas try to find the origin of Yulgamot and they try to come up with many different theories and hypotheses. You also have a Query Mount. The Shulsaga actually consider Yulgamot to be quite sacred. And here is where they can excavate sacred stones to serve as discs in their journeys. When it comes to feats, here in Yulgamot you have the magic trick. You choose one spell that creates or conjures a tangible object, whether physical or made of force, and you are able to manipulate that object beyond its typical uses. So you have a series of floating disc tricks that depend on this fit, like defensive disc, disc rider, and drifting defense. Many of these are basically tailored around using a floating disc as a sort of surfboard that you can also use to shield yourself, that is, you grab an edge of the disc and you can actually lift it up to use it as a shield. So this is uh, surely a very flashy or gnarly way to fight your opponents, kind of like a surfer. And you also have a sorcerer bloodline, which is the astral bloodline. So at some point, you had some sort of strong connection with the astral plane. Maybe you had like a brush with an astral conduit and now we have an unusual connection to both time and space. So this is all about modifying the flow of time and displacement in any spell or ability that you are using. So you have new bonus spells such as uh, True Strike, False Life, Ethereal Jaunt. You also have bonus feats such as Combat Reflexes, Dodge, Lightning Reflexes. And when it comes to Bloodline Arcana, when you cast a spell, you can actually choose to enhance the next spell you cast before the end of your next turn, increasing the enhanced spell's saving throw difficulty. However, the level of the enhanced spell must be lower than that of the spell used to activate this ability. Your bloodline powers consist of, for example, Astral Warp, which is creating a sparkling field within 30 feet that distorts time, and this field lasts until the beginning of your next turn. Any creature that enters this area and that starts its turn within the cube actually takes force damage. You also have some other effects that allow you, for example, to accelerate your spellcasting dramatically. You can also send your consciousness into the astral plane for a limited number of times per day. You can also halt the effects of different conditions or afflictions. And at the highest level, you can become or develop a timeless soul. So you get different benefits like becoming immune to retroactive aging and you do not gain negative levels when slain on the astral plane while using astral projection, etc. So what do I think of Distant Realms? This is a great companion with the Planar Adventures book if you want to focus your campaign on otherworldly journeys. All of the cities are sufficiently detailed. I only gave you a few tidbits of information but many of these cities have a lot of adventure sites, many places to explore, 
They do not go too much into detail as to giving you stats of all of the NPCs or telling you everything there is to know to different districts and places of interest. They just give you enough paragraphs to come up with your own adventures, but you could easily base an entire campaign on a single one of these cities. However, as I mentioned before, I think it would be even better if you were to have a campaign where the characters have to move from one city to the other. I also think that even though this is geared towards the Pathfinder campaign setting, you could also use it in other campaign worlds. Even if you're homebrewing your own stuff or using some other popular world, you could also use these cities and make some modifications, change some names and some non-player character relations and you will have a city to use in any sort of planar campaign. I also find some of the archetypes uh, really fun, some of them quite creative, like the spiritualist archetype that you can separate into two, and the way that you can use a disc to surf around the battlefield, that's a really cool, that actually gets you excited to play as any of these archetypes. I also feel that the new spells and fits actually add to the game, specifically in the planar adventures aspect, and remember, even if you do not own Planar Adventures, you could also get this source book and use the system reference document to obtain the rules information related to gravity, planar effects. Each of these cities has more to it or that makes it different to the other cities. Each place feels quite unique. Some places feel a bit more stationary, as you could see. Some others feel more temporary or even uh, moving about on their own through the planes or the inhabitants using certain cities as passageways or gateways to other places. So I definitely recommend that you get Distant Realms if you're planning a campaign featuring a lot of planar travel and experiences using gates and tunnels and passageways while experiencing different conditions that greatly differ from the material plane experience. Well, thanks for watching my review. If you have any comments or questions, please let me know. See you later.